Okay, now it's time to introduce our new and improved formula for gravitational potential energy. So I will remind you of two, uh, two results from previously in the semester. Number one, when you're talking about the work done by a conservative force, we say that the change in the potential energy is the negative of the work done by that conservative force. This is true for springs, and it's true for gravity. And as an example, I'll use somebody that goes to the top of a building. Maybe they took stairs to get there, and the whole way they were carrying, I don't know, a bag of potatoes, a dumbbell. So here they are standing at the top with their dumbbell or bag of potatoes. I'll just draw a rectangle to indicate some sort of mass. And we know that this, this mass is now endowed with more gravitational energy because it's been raised in the gravitational field. So on the way up, its displacement, I'll call this delta y, its displacement was positive, but all the while, as the person was carrying this object upwards, the force on the object was down. So while the person was doing positive work on this mass, they had to lift it up the stairs. Gravity was doing negative work because gravity was opposite the displacement, okay? So the, the change in potential energy was positive. This mass gained potential energy, and yet the work done by gravity was negative. So it seems reasonable that if gravity did, let's say, negative 100 joules of work, well, then the, the mass's potential, potential energy just increased by 100 joules. That's where this relation comes from. And this is like saying uh, U final minus U initial is the negative of the work done. Well, we showed that the work done was negative mg delta y, right? Displacement is positive. Gravity points downwards. The work done is negative force times distance. Or you could say that the potential energy final is the potential energy initial minus mg del delta y. I just realized I made a goof here. Uh, the work is negative, but delta u is the negative of that negative quantity. So I really ought to have a positive sign here. Yes. Okay. Now, if you go ahead and make your initial y coordinate down here on the floor, if you make or the ground, if I make that um, zero, put the origin at the, the ground floor or the floor of the room that you're in, whatever seems sensible, then I could say the potential energy at some final position, and I'll just call this u. I, I don't even need to specify f for final anymore. I'll say uh, the potential energy at the bottom plus mg times y minus zero, right? So I'm evaluating, my final position is just some arbitrary location or arbitrary height, y. And my initial position specifically is down here. So this tells me how the potential at an arbitrary height, y, compares to the potential energy on the ground. The potential energy at that height is whatever potential energy you had at the ground plus this additional amount, mgy. So that's really our starting point. And we, we took the additional step earlier in the semester of saying, you know what, the easiest value to pick for u naught would just be zero. Let's just say that when this mass is on the ground, it has no joules of potential energy, because that's very convenient. And then the, the potential energy at any height y would just be mgy and not u naught plus mgy. So we're gonna repeat that thought process now, but be more precise, because remember, um, if you calculate the work done by gravity, this expression is only valid to the extent that 9.8 is constant. Now, when you go from the bottom of the D building, for instance, to the roof of the D building, the value of G does change measurably. If you had a, an expensive gra gravimeter, how do you pronounce that? I'm sure you can buy something commercially that would reflect the change in the G field from the bottom to the top of the building. But it's a very small effect and insignificant for most purposes. However, if you go from the surface of the Earth up to the space station, then G definitely changes by a significant amount, and mg delta y is no longer valid. So let's go back to the drawing board, so to speak. Let's start from here. We're going to look at the change in potential energy as you uh, allow an object to fall from infinitely far away from the Earth to some arbitrary height near the Earth, or sort of near the Earth. Okay, so here's planet Earth. And let's put the origin of our r axis at the center of the Earth. This is r equals zero, and then here's our r axis. It's positive in that direction. 
So this is the direction of increasing r. And let's suppose that we know the potential way out here at infinity, infinity, super far away from Earth. And we allow an object to fall towards the Earth. Now, as it's falling towards the Earth, here's my little mass falling towards the Earth. The uh, displacement is always towards the Earth. I'm imagining that it's falling that way. And the gravity force is also towards the Earth. So I could label these two vectors. That's the dr vector with a vector symbol. This is the gravity force. And remember that the little piece of work done, if you want to use the dot product, is force dotted with displacement. And because these two vectors are parallel, when I take the dot product, I get a positive quantity. Gravity is doing positive work on the way in. Now, it turns out that the result we're going to arrive at doesn't actually matter, or it doesn't depend on coming in along a straight line path. You could even come in along a zigzag path or a spiral, it really doesn't matter. You get the same result. I'm not gonna show that because we haven't used a vector calculus a whole lot here this semester. But I'll just write it like this. DW, the small piece of work done as you allow this mass to fall towards the Earth. Well, that's force times infinitesimal displacement. And we know that the force is G times, how about I just use big M for the mass of the planet and little m for the mass of my falling object. My baked potato, I guess we're going with potatoes today. G big M, little m over R squared. This is the force at some arbitrary distance R from the center of the Earth times dr. Okay, so you, if you allow your object to fall through a tiny distance dr under the action of this force from gravity, then this product is the amount of work that gravity did uh, just over that tiny displacement. But we would like to know the total work done as we let this object fall from infinitely far away to some specific value of r. So how about, how about we imagine that it falls all the way to here? I'll call this the final distance r from the origin. We'd like to know what is the potential energy when your object has fallen down to right there? How much potential energy, uh, excuse me, potential energy does it have? So I'm going to use the same relation that I had right here. Delta u, well that's the potential energy at r final minus the potential energy, and I'll just put a subscript infinity to indicate this is the potential energy at infinity. So the change in potential energy from this initial position to this final position would be the negative of the work done. Now, what is the work done? Well, we're going to have to use an integral. So that would be the integral of F dotted with dr, right? The integral of force dotted with displacement. So I'll put parentheses around that to indicate this is the work done by gravity. And I'm just saying that the change in potential energy is the negative of the work done. Now, you have to be careful with setting up the integral. Um, you have to take into account the direction of dr compared to fg. I'm not going to dwell on that too much. I'll just show you what you can do. Uh, we need this integral to be positive, right? We know we've already established that gravity is doing positive work. So that would be... Um, think back to calculus, you need to integrate from a lower limit to an upper limit, so I'm going to go from R final to infinity. If I switch these, my integral would come out negative. G big M little m over R squared dr. And this is easy. This is something you could have done probably in the first month of your calculus course. Okay, so let's carefully move stuff around. I'm going to take u infinity, put that on the other side. So I'll say that the potential energy at distance r final is the potential energy at infinity plus this extra amount. Now, I can pull out the g big M little m because those are just constants. So minus g big M little m. And what is the antiderivative of this quantity, or really 1 over r squared? The antiderivative of r to the negative 2, is it not? 1 over r squared is r to the negative 2. So you know the power rule. You raise the power to negative 1 and divide by that new power which is negative one over r. So I've got a negative one over r and I'm evaluating it at r final and infinity. Now what happens when you plug in the infinity? One over infinity, we take that to be zero. So that limit just goes away. And check it out, we've got a minus sign and a minus sign, those cancel. But then when you evaluate at the lower limit, you're subtracting, right? It's final uh, minus initial when it comes time to apply the limits. So it looks to me like what we wind up with is u at infinity minus, because there were three minus signs altogether, minus g big M little m over r final. Okay?
Now, just like previously, where we said the, the potential energy at any arbitrary height above the ground is whatever potential energy your mass has on the ground plus this additional amount because you lifted it through gravity. Now we're saying something very similar. The potential energy that you have at any distance r final from the center of the Earth is the potential energy you would have at infinity plus the, uh, the extra work done as you let the, the object fall from infinity to r final. And I'm just I'm realizing here, but that's, that's positive work. And we've got this negative one. So I know I've done this right because I remember the formula, but I, uh, I misspoke again, just slightly. What I meant to say was the potential energy at our final is whatever potential energy you have at the um, at infinity minus the work done by gravity. Remember that? That's, that's our starting point. The change of potential energy is the negative of the work done. So since gravity is doing positive work as your object falls towards the Earth, then yes, it makes sense that we're subtracting a positive quantity. If you don't follow all that, it's okay. You just have to know how to use the final result. So here's where we have to choose how to evaluate the potential energy at the infinity. What would be the most convenient choice? Because we could pick any number we want and stick with it. All that's physically meaningful is change in potential energy. Because later we're going to use conservation of mechanical energy and argue that any loss in potential is accompanied by an increase in kinetic. So it's the change in you that matters. And that's why this arbitrary constant is insignificant. We could pick any number we want. Well, just like before, where the easiest choice was to say, hey, the potential energy on the ground is zero. Let's just say that the potential energy at infinity is zero. We'll go ahead and set u infinity equal to zero. That's the easiest choice. And then, instead of dealing with the subscript f for r final, it's just assumed that when we use the letter r, we're talking about our final position. So the, the potential energy at any distance r from the center of the Earth, or the planet that we're talking about, is negative g big M little m over r. And you must know that for chapter 13. You must know that going into the exam. This is a very important result from the chapter. This is our new and improved formula for potential energy. And it may, it may look kind of strange because previously we had the potential energies mgy. What is going on here? Because uh, there's a g here, little g. I don't see any little g here. And there's a y instead of an r. And also the r is in the denominator here. And there's a minus sign here, but no minus sign here. So at first it seems like it would be difficult to reconcile these two, but it's really not at all. Let's do this. Remember, uh, previously I was, when we were using MGY for potential energy, we just took the reference potential to be zero at the ground. Let's try this. Alternatively, let U not equal, and I'm going to go back over here now and use this formula. So at Earth's surface, potential energy at R equal to the radius of the Earth or the planet, whatever planet you're talking about. So if I go back to the picture here, what is the potential energy here for right at the surface? According to our formula here, you would just plug in big R for little r. Negative G, big M, little m over the radius of the Earth. So and I'm running out of space here. Let's plug that in. That our new and improved potential energy formula, let's evaluate it at the surface of the Earth and plug that in as our reference potential. So we'll say let u not equal negative G, big M, little m over radius of the Earth. And then our uh, potential energy uh, from previously in the semester would be negative g big M little m over radius of the earth plus m g y. Okay, now, what is y? y is the coordinate that we use. Uh, it's your height above the surface of the earth. So if I go back to this picture, my r axis starts at the center of the earth, but my y axis, I could, I could also use this coordinate system, call this x and y, my y-axis also points in the direction of increasing r, but my origin is at the surface, not at the center. And now we can appreciate the agreement between our new formula and our old formula with this updated reference potential. Here is what I'm talking about. 
if I call this the uh, potential energy, it's the potential energy axis, and I call this the R axis or the Y axis, right, well, what, is, what does this look like? Forget about the constants. That just stretches your, your function vertically. We're basically talking about negative 1 over R. Well, 1 over R has that shape. You guys know that. It's a rectangular hyperbola. The ne negative sign flips it onto the other side of the axis. So this is really the graph of negative 1 over R. That's, it's that scoopy graph, and it's on the bottom side of the R axis. That's because of the minus sign. And at least we can see that as you go away from the Earth, away from the center, as your R coordinate increases, you can see the potential energy is also increasing. Makes sense, right? We know that as you go away from the Earth, potential energy should be increasing. Now, there's a particular R coordinate called the radius of the Earth. Remember, this R is your distance from the center. So right here would correspond to the center of the Earth. And as soon as you get beneath the surface, the physics gets different, and you actually cannot use this formula anyway. So it's really only valid from the surface of the Earth outwards. Well, if you look at this formula, this is what we were using for most of the semester. MGY, uh, I, now I've added this negative term. So MGY would be just a straight line, right? Wouldn't it just go up like this? MGY is proportional to Y. But we've now subtracted this term, which would bring this whole line down. I have to change the slope a little bit to make it match. But this right here is what I'll call U at the surface plus M G Y. That's this straight line curve. This is our new and improved curve. And do you see that for relatively small displacements from the surface of the Earth, those two functions are practically in, indistinguishable. We have drawn the negative one over R curve and I've drawn the line M G Y scooted down by this amount, which is that. And the two functions agree really well. That is why if you do, physics problems about um, kicking a football or dropping something from the top of a tall building or even from a mountain, it really doesn't matter whether you use MGY or this new formula, you are going to get comparable results. But by the time you get out here, there's a significant difference between the two curves. They start to diverge. So when you're, you know, one, when you're at a distance from the Earth's center equal to two times the Earth's radius, like if this is the Earth, and you build some ridiculously tall building and you're up here, uh, the potential energy up here is definitely going to be different from just MGY. So will this be valid up here? Definitely not. It's only valid for distances like, you know, from, from sea level to the top of a mountain. Because the top of a mountain from outer space, you can't even see it. You might think that Mount Everest would be a bump like this, you know, like a pimple seen from outer space. It's not even visible from what I've read. Okay. So this is our new and improved formula, negative G and M over R. Now, it's a lot like Newton's universal law of gravity. So not you've got a big G, product of the masses, but the main difference is it's R to the first power, not R to the uh, second power. It's not a, an inverse square law. So it's really easy at first to confuse those two. Don't forget that the integral of force is basically potential energy. So if you're integrating an inverse square law, that's why you wind up with a, a one over R, it's potential. It's a one over R potential, but a one over R squared force. Okay, so we've already done the work, no pun intended. We, we did the work integral, we have our formula. You never have to do it again, really, uh, not for this class. You just have to know how to use the formula. So let's immediately apply the conservation of energy principle and calculate escape speed. This is a, a fun calculation. It's very, very simple to do computationally. It's conceptually, it's a little more challenging. But here's the idea. If you want to launch something from the surface of the Earth, everybody knows that when you throw something, it tends to come back down to the surface. You could throw a baseball, but it's just going to plop right back down. And we've been regarding the trajectory of that baseball as a parabola thus far. But I'm going to point out now, since we've talked about Kepler's first law, we know that the planets all move in elliptical orbits around the sun, and the moon even moves in an elliptical orbit. So you've probably heard this before, but when you throw something, uh, more precisely than saying it's a parabolic trajectory, it's actually trying to make an elliptical path with the center of the Earth as one focus. So the other focus would be over here. It just looks like a parabola locally. 
but a more accurate description would be to say that the trajectory is a piece, excuse me, a piece of an ellipse. Okay. Well, what if we wanted to throw this faster so that it uh, goes farther out before it plops back down even faster? You know, we've, we've talked about how if you throw it fast enough, you could actually put it into orbit around the Earth. What if you want to throw it so fast that it just never comes back so that it escapes? What is the minimum possible speed in order that your thrown object escapes the Earth? Now, we're going to ignore atmospheric drag. Of course, in real life, if you, if you threw something at you know, five miles per second, it'll probably burn up in the air because of all the friction with the air, air particles. So it's difficult to even talk about an escape speed if your object just burns up. So let's pretend that there is no atmosphere, like we're on the moon. How fast would you have to throw a baseball so that it not just you know, flies a thousand miles across the moon's surface, how about it just never comes back because you threw it so fast? Well, if you try to think about this in terms of forces, it gets confusing because what is the range of the gravitational forces? If this is mass of the Earth, mass of the baseball, distance between them, how far out do you have to go? What is R before the force of gravity ceases to be? So here's one over R squared. Where do you have to go before this force really drops to zero? Well, it approaches zero asymptotically. You're, you're never going to get to a distance where the force is actually zero. You have to go out to infinity, basically, before the force shut off. So does that suggest that it's impossible to escape? If you can't get anywhere in the universe without escaping the pull of gravity, does that mean that you're always going to fall back? It's a difficult question. Well, think about it this way. Can't you go out far enough so that, um, uh, what I meant to say is can't you throw your object fast enough so that even when it gets to, like let's say by the time it gets out to here, the force is still decreasing very gradually, but it's practically you know, 1% of what it was at the Earth's surface, let's say. If you can throw it so fast that when it gets to here, it's still moving pretty quickly, and yet the pull of gravity is practically zero, Maybe that makes it plausible that it could escape. But this is a calculus notion. It's like, uh, which is changing more quickly? The, is the speed decreasing more quickly or is the force of gravity dropping more quickly? It's like a competition between the two. And the only way to really know the answer is to use calculus, to use an integral. It's kind of like the notion of improper integrals. Like, is the area going to converge to a limit? I mean, you're, you're still accumulating more area, but each little additional piece of area is, is subsequently smaller than the last so anyway we don't have to stress about it too much we're just going to talk about potential energy so the idea is if you get out far enough your potential energy is practically zero because remember that's the whole point of this right when we're using this formula now if you plug in infinity for r all this stuff over infinity is basically zero so when you go infinitely far, your potential energy is zero. So if, if you throw this thing fast enough, you can give it so much energy that even when it gets out to infinity, of course, you can't really get there, its potential energy would be zero, and yet you would still have leftover kinetic energy, then you're good. So let's do a little bar chart. I don't usually use these, but if you throw something from the surface of the Earth, and it's got this much kinetic energy, let's see here, and this much potential energy. So K initial plus U initial. Well, we're going to argue that total energy is conserved. So as your, as your thrown baseball rises from the earth, it's going to gain potential energy at the expense of kinetic energy. So this bar will go down, this bar will go up, and maybe, um, maybe you wind up with something like this. This is potential energy, and this is the kinetic energy. So as you leave the Earth, your potential energy has to rise. That's unavoidable. And as a consequence, your kinetic energy will decrease. Let me shade in the kinetic energy. You can see how the objects slow down. But let's say this represents the potential energy at infinity. Like you've already gotten to infinity, your potential energy is not going to rise any more than that. Because what does the potential energy graph look like? This. Once you get to infinity, your potential energy is done increasing. It does most of the increase as you're escaping uh, the near part, or you know, as you're leaving the, the vicinity of Earth. Once you get out to like 10 times the Earth's radius, 100 times the Earth's radius, you're practically already escaped. So your potential energy is, is basically done increasing. 
So if you, if you get out to that distance or close, close enough to infinity and your potential energy is done increasing and you still have leftover kinetic energy, then you've escaped, you're still moving. So that's the argument we're going to make. We wanna throw the ball just fast enough so that it, when, it, when it gets to infinity, it's, it's just barely slow down and come to a stop. You get that? If, if it stopped before it got to infinity, what would it do? Fall back down the other direction. But if it makes it to infinity before it comes to a stop, well then once it's there, the force of gravity has, has ceased and it's not gonna fall back. I guess that's one way of putting it. You need to throw the object fast enough, give it enough energy that it makes it all the way to infinity and it's just barely used up its kinetic energy. So it doesn't come to rest until it gets to infinity. But at that point, the force has shut off and it's not gonna fall back down. All right? It works out very simply with the algebra. Conceptually, a little challenging. Okay, so when we talk about, I guess I'll just stick with this graphic here. Um, I'll use initial for the, the, uh, the moment when this thing is launched. So the energy, at the initial time of launch, all that mechanical energy still has to be there when you get out to infinity, which I'll call time final. And this is only true, remember, the change in mechanical energy is only zero if there's no non-conservative forces. So your book would really use a subscript mech for mechanical. I'm just calling it E. No air drag, no friction, no dissipative forces of any kind. And also no introduction of a rocket fuel because that would actually increase the energy. All right, well, we've got kinetic energy initially, potential energy initially, kinetic energy final, potential energy final. And it's understood we're talking about gravitational potential energy in this problem. Now, because of our choice of reference potential, remember, I'm saying the potential energy at any distance from the center of the Earth is the potential energy of infinity minus g m m over r. This is the negative of the work done by gravity in going from infinity to position r. Because we chose this to be zero, then that, that alone is our potential energy curve. And if I may, real quick, before I plug stuff in here, if we had chosen a different reference potential, like what if you wanted to say that the potential energy at infinity is 10 joules, all that would do is shift this curve up. See that? It would just shift it up. That doesn't change the physical predictions. It just changes where your reference potential is. The shape of the curve is the same in all instances. The shape of the curve really tells you the force at every, at every distance r, right? The, remember the slope is the force? It's that result, force is the negative derivative of r. So do you see that the magnitude of the slope is decreasing? The slope is, coming, is becoming shallower and shallower, which indicates that the force is dropping to zero. You, can, you extract the same information from all of these curves. So adding a different reference potential doesn't change that result at all. Okay, now because of our choice, what's the potential energy when we get to infinity? Plug in infinity, you get zero. So that's just gone. And also, we're arguing that we wanna just barely make it to infinity. We don't wanna to get to infinity and still be moving because that's leftover kinetic energy. That's not what we're, what we're interested in. We wanna know what's the bare minimum energy we have to give to this launched baseball so that it makes it out to infinity. So it's just gonna barely make it to the finish line with zero kinetic energy. Now you could see a, a homework problem or otherwise an exam problem where you need to get to infinity and still be moving with a certain amount of energy. And then you would not plug in zero for that term. But right now we're looking for the, the bare minimum for the escape speed. So we've got one half M V initial, but instead of calling it V initial, I'm going to call it V escape because we're looking for the, the minimum speed at launch so that this thing makes it out of the uh, the gravitational field of the Earth. And then we've got negative G, M, M. Well, what is the initial distance from the center of the Earth? If you launch from the surface of the Earth, you know, never mind about the, the height of this person, maybe their hand is one and a half meters above the, the ground, but the ground is over 6,000 kilometers from the center. So this extra distance is insignificant. Our initial distance is really just the radius of the Earth. And I'm just gonna plug in big R without the subscript E because Really, our logic applies to any planet, not even a planet. It could uh, apply to escape speed from something like the moon, any spherical planet-shaped object or planet-like object. That's actually one of the new definitions for a planet, right? It's got to be massive enough that the gravity pulls it into a spherical shape. 
if you go out to the asteroid belt, there are smaller asteroids that are, they look like lumpy potatoes. There's those potatoes again. They look like lumpy potatoes because they're, they're not massive enough to have crushed themselves into a sphere. Okay, there's the condition. And if you think about it, you can put this over here and it basically says you have to have enough kinetic energy to overcome. Now, the, the interpretation, I take it back. It's not as obvious as it was previously. It's really not. You have to start from here. I was going to suggest that there's some alternative. You could just say, hey, uh, you need enough, enough kinetic energy to achieve the potential energy at the end. But the problem with that way of thinking is now the potential energy at the end is zero. So you can't say, hey, one half mv squared, is, one half mv squared needs to equal the final potential, which is zero, because that, that would be v equals zero. That makes no sense. So you really have to just start from here and plug in the appropriate terms. Okay, you can solve for v. Notice little m cancels. Doesn't matter if you're launching a baseball out of the Earth's gravitational field or um, launching a spacecraft with no rockets. You have to launch it at escape speed. You arrive at the same result. The escape speed, speed is root 2g big M over r. There it is. So the, the more massive the planet that's in the numerator, the faster you'd have to launch something so that it escapes, and the smaller the radius. So if you had, if, if you could somehow crush Earth, take all the mass of the Earth and crush it into a smaller volume, which would make it more dense. So instead of a density like rock, maybe you could crush it down so it had a density more like iron or lead. Then the escape speed would, would go up. You'd have the same mass and a smaller radius. They both affect the escape speed. So it has something to do with the density here. It's not enough to just say that the escape is proportional to density. And it doesn't actually end up being that simple, but it's related to density because mass and volume or radius both appear here. Okay, should you memorize this? Well, if you've done enough homework, you probably do have it memorized. But it's much more important to know how to start from here, to know how to use the principle of energy conservation and evaluate the potential energy appropriately using our new and improved formula. That's much more important. So I'm gonna say contrast this with um, orbital speed. If you're orbiting a massive object at any distance r, we saw that the, the proper, or the only allowed orbital speed is root gm over r. So instead of the 2 gm over r, we've just got gm over r. Okay, that should help you memorize the two. One's got a root two, the other one doesn't. Now, remember how kinetic energy is proportional to the square of speed, one half mv squared? If you square this and square this, uh, they're the same except for a factor of two out front. So, but you know, what if you were orbiting close to the Earth's surface? We talked about low Earth orbit. So if you have a satellite practically skimming the surface of the Earth, its distance from the center of the Earth is practically Earth's radius. So then instead of having just any old R here, you would have the radius of the Earth. When you square these two, you do get the, ex the same expression except for the two out front. The square root's gone if you squared it. Uh, and since kinetic energy is proportional to V squared, that means that it takes twice the kinetic energy to escape the Earth than it does to just put something into orbit. That's kind of a nice result, right? If you want to launch something fast enough so that it leaves the Earth and never comes back, you have to give it twice as much energy as you'd have to give it just to put it into low Earth orbit. Twice as expensive, right? Twice the fuel. Now, the speeds, how do they compare? That's a root two. You'd have to go root two times as fast. But kinetic energy depends on the square of the speed. Okay, so we've, all right, I've moved through a lot of material right there. Why don't we uh, immediately apply this to a problem. Now, calculating escape, escape speeds by plugging the numbers in here, you have to make sure that you're familiar with your calculator and how to use it. So why don't we uh, estimate the escape speed from a comet? And as an example, I'll use this comet from a couple years ago, Comet churyumov Gerasimenko. It had this long Russian name. I don't know why I have that memorized. But I'm going to look up a graphic of that comet and pull up some specs, and we'll calculate the escape speed from that comet. Now, the comet is shaped irregularly. Again, it's kind of like a lumpy potato, but we'll just pretend it's like a sphere, and you're standing on the surface. And let's look at how fast you'd have to be moving to escape from it. Like, is it possible to jump from a comet and never come back? Obviously, on Earth, that's no good. You jump, you fall right back down. Uh, to launch something fast enough from the Earth that it never comes back, I don't think that's even possible because, again, it, it would burn up in the atmosphere. But we're going to see that on something as small as a comet, 
you could probably jump fast enough to never come back. Deal back in 2014, I believe it was, because was it NASA or the European Space Agency? I forget which agency, but they actually sent a probe out to the comet and landed a lander on the surface. And because of this issue of escape velocity, we're gonna see that the escape velocity is really low. If the lander had bounced off the surface, it could have bounced quickly enough that it just never came back to the surface. So they had some harpoons, or the uh, lander was equipped with harpoons that were supposed to fasten it to the surface. And I think they malfunctioned and the lander did in fact bounce. It didn't escape, but it bounced like a couple miles away and landed in the shadows where the solar panels were not receiving light for several months. So the mission didn't go as planned. But here's a nice graphic comparing the size of the comet to downtown Los Angeles. So it looks huge, but you know, it's the size of a mountain, maybe a, a modest size mountain or a big mountain, I'm not sure, but it's nowhere near the size of a planet. I pulled up some facts about the comet on Wikipedia. Churyumov Gerasimenko, that's a fun name. They're telling us, you know, it's got this irregular shape, but they're saying it's longest and widest for basically four by four kilometers. So I will regard it as a sphere with a diameter of three kilometers to be conservative. And at first I was thinking it's probably made out of rock. So it's got a density of two to 3,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Remember, water is at 1,000. But then I scroll down here and I see, actually the uh, mean density is more like, well, here they're saying half of a gram per, cu per cubic centimeter. Multiply by 1,000 to convert that into kilograms per cubic meter. So it's not even 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. It's more like 500. That's less dense than water, which tells us that this thing is made out of ice, mostly ice, probably water ice. Remember, ice can refer to various other frozen substances or solid substances. Okay, so even though they give us the mass here, I could just cheat and use the mass. Let's get some practice with turning density and volume into mass. So back to the notes here. Remember that if density is constant, if you can assume that the, the density of the material is uniform throughout the volume here, then you can say the total mass, and I should use big M, huh? Total mass of the comet would be its density in kilograms per cubic meter times volume. See what we're doing? Density is kilograms for every cubic meter times the number of cubic meters that will give us the number of kilograms of mass. Well, the volume for a sphere, hopefully you, you know this, is four-thirds pi r. This is outer radius cubed. I think you should have that memorized as an engineering student. Four-thirds pi r cubed. If you take the derivative, you get the surface area of a sphere, which is kind of cool. Four pi r squared. Okay, so we go back to our formula for escape speed. Yeah, you probably should have it memorized, but you know what's even cooler is to know how to derive it every time. So really quickly, I'll do that. Again, even though you saw it just a moment ago, just for practice, initial energy has to equal final energy. Well, when we, when we get to infinity, we just want to be barely moving fast enough to get there. So zero kinetic left over, zero potential at infinity. And our initial kinetic energy is one half little m v escape squared. And then the initial poten potential energy would be this formula evaluated, excuse me, evaluated at the surface of the asteroid or the comet, which means our distance from the center of the comet is the radius of the comet. Remember, I'm modeling it as a sphere. Little m's cancel and we get this result. V escape oops, is root two G big M over R. Well, rather than calculate the mass separately using this formula, why don't we plug this formula in and maybe we'll get something a little simpler. So V escape, is root, I'll put the 2g over r here, and the mass, well that's the density times the volume, so density times 4 thirds pi big R cubed. And I think we can simplify this, 2 times 4 is 8, you know if we wanted we could pull out the square root of 4 which is 2, but let's just leave everything under the radical, r cubed over r is r squared, and that probably is worth pulling out. Fine, so I'll do that, v escape, since we've got an r or to the second power under the radical. I'll pull that out and say that's r. The square root of r squared is r root 8g pi over, whoops, I've got the density rho over 3. That's what it looks like. 
Look to me. Okay, so for a given density, if you've got various comets all having the same density, they're made out of the same material, it seems like the escape speed is proportional to the radius. That's kind of interesting. Twice the diameter of the comet would mean twice the required escape speed. And you know, I've done this problem before, and I feel like I'm making a mistake because this doesn't seem totally familiar, but I don't see what my mistake, mistake would be. Density times volume. Yeah, checks out. Okay. You'd have to you'd have to quadruple the density in order to have twice the escape speed. The square root of the density means root four times the density. Density would be double the escape speed. Let's calculate this now for our comet because I, I went with three kilometers, did I not? Okay, three kilometers. Now, since we're talking about speed, no, I'm sorry, three was the diameter. I, I estimated a diameter of three, so we're talking about one and a half kilometers for the radius. Since I'm talking about a speed, then I, I can infer that the units that come out of the radical sign would have to be inverse seconds, because I need kilometers per second. Of course, if I'd plugged in the radius in meters, then my speed would be meters per second. Okay, let's do this in the calculador here. I don't know photons here. Okay. Eight times G, which is 6.67 E negative 11, times pi times, now the density from Wikipedia was around 500 kilograms per cubic meter. That's half of a gram per cubic centimeter. So times 500 divided by three, take the square root, multiply by R, which is one and a half, and I get, right, well, this can't be right. Eight times 10 to the negative fourth. Eight times 10 to the negative fourth meters per second. What? Well, that would be 0.8 times 10 to the negative third. So I used one of the negative powers of 10 to rewrite eight as 0.8 because a thousandth of a meter is basically, or is a millimeter, and 0.8 is basically one. So this is basically one millimeter. Per second. That's so slow. You only have to jump from the surface at a speed of one millimeter per second so that you never come back. No wonder that con or the lander, I think it was called Philea, there was Rosetta was the probe and then the lander that landed, I think it was called Philea. You can read about it. Even if it bounced off at one millimeter per second, it's not coming back. That didn't seem right. Let's check these numbers here. Eight times 6.67. You know what? I'll check. I'll pause and check. I realized my mistake. You probably realized it as I was doing it. I'm so embarrassed. Kilometers, right? And I didn't even, this is horrible. I just did what you guys do on your exams, where you only write half of your equation and then you put the answer, so I'm really confused. Uh, there's all this, yeah, I should have actually written all the numbers out. Let's just skip that and say V escape equals dot, 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 eight times 10 to the negative fourth, this was kilometers per second. See, there's the danger of using non-SI units. You can get confused. Okay, so if you plug all these numbers in SI, then you would actually get this many kilometers per second. Now I can convert kilometers to meters, multiply by 1,000, and that would make this eight times 10 to the negative one meters per second. So 0.8 meters per second, which is something like, or is 80 centimeters per second. If you want to convert from meters per second to miles per hour, just multiply by two and a quarter. Either way, you can see it's a small number. Let's see here. If I want to convert to miles per hour, under two miles per hour. Well, people walk about that speed, right? Don't they walk one or two miles per hour? So conceivably, you could definitely escape from the surface of this uh, comet. And maybe not enough to Maybe you can't jump that quick, but if you could get running, if you could run along the surface and launch off of something like a spring, no problem. And it's definitely conceivable that this uh, lander could bounce off the surface fast enough that it never comes back. Again, th this is all just approximate anyway, right? Because I approximated the diameter of the comet. I could go back to Wikipedia and see if they list the escape speed, but it's hard to define anyway. Remember, the, um, the comet is really not spherically shaped. Calculating the escape speed for an irregularly shaped object precisely be a lot more challenging. I'm not even sure how to do that, to be honest. You would have to, okay, what you'd have to do is 
integrate the actual density over the real volume, taking into consideration the shape of the comet, and get a, a function for the potential energy at every point on the surface. And then you could use the same conservation principle to calculate the escape speed from any point on the comet. And I've never really wondered about that before. Like, does the escape speed depend on where you are on the comet, or would it change from one place to the other? It doesn't depend on where you are for a sphere, but that may not be true for, um, yeah, I think it would not matter. I think this, the entire surface is what they call a gravitational equipotential. Let's look at one other type of problem. Let's say we've got three masses arranged at the corners of an equilateral triangle. And let's suppose that uh, these two are smaller. I'll call them each M1. And here's a larger mass, M2. But all these distances are the same, equilateral triangle. And these are not actual rods connecting the masses. They're, they're just representing the distance between them. So maybe you've got three rocks way out in space that are currently in this position. That's kind of an unlikely scenario. But, uh, and then you'd like to reach in with your cosmic hands, grab them, and pull all of them until they're all infinitely far apart from each other. So grab these two, pull them apart super far, super far, all three of them, make sure, they're, make sure that each one is infinitely far from the other two. And there's a variety of ways, or, you know, the way you do that, there's probably an infinite number of ways, like the directions that they all go, but the end result is the same, they're all infinitely far away. And the question is, how much work would you have to do to separate those? Like, obviously, it's going to take you some energy to pull these apart against their mutual gravitational attraction. Well, how much energy is that? How much of a workout is that? How many calories will you burn? It's going to depend on how massive these are. Because to pull apart two marbles in space, you barely even feel it. The force of attraction between them is so weak, it would cost you nothing. But to pull, let's say, a 10-pound mass from the surface of the Earth, that's real work. I mean, imagine if you were tasked with taking a 10-pound dumbbell and carrying it all the way to the top of Mount Everest. Again, that's, that's hardly any distance compared to the radius. So if you want to carry a 10-pound dumbbell just to the top of Mount Everest, that's a lot of work for a human being. Well, what if you wanted to carry it clear out of Earth's gravitational field? That's way more work. Of course, most of the work happens in here because of the shape of the potential energy curve. It levels off pretty rapidly. So you're going to have to do a lot of work in here, and then it's not going to cost so much as you get farther away. Okay, well, in order to answer this, we have to look more carefully at this formula for potential energy. So I've been talking about the potential energy of some small object in the vicinity of a planet. And R has, has been the distance from your object to the center of the, of the planet. Now, most of these problems involve the conservation of mechanical energy. So we say delta U plus delta K is zero. And that means that the increase in kinetic energy is the negative of the change in potential energy. So it's really it's only delta u that matters because that's what tells us how much kinetic energy our masses acquire. Now, if you were holding these two apart, here's the planet, here's your baseball, and then you let them go, you let them both go. Which one does the moving? You know, they they pull on each other equally. I forgot to mention that, but in Newton's law of gravity, the assumption is that if there's a mutual attraction, so two force factors equal and opposite. It's Newton's third law applied to gravity. Well, this one's way more massive. So if they pull on each other with equal forces, this is the one that does the moving, not this one. So in a sense, you could say that the potential energy that was in the system shows up as kinetic energy of the little guy. The potential energy gets transformed into the kinetic energy of the little guy. And that's why we often say that the, the little mass has the potential energy. Like when you lift a rock to the top of a building, you gave, we say that you gave the rock potential energy. But it's really not so obvious if you make the sizes more comparable. What if we were talking about a, a moon and a small asteroid? Now which one does the moving? Well, this one's going to move. Uh, it's going to accelerate more quickly. But this one will, will probably also start to move. Now what if you're talking about two equal size asteroids with a mutual attraction? So in all cases, it's a mutual attraction. Now they're both going to move. So which one has the kinetic energy? Excuse me. Which one has the potential energy initially if they both acquire kinetic energy? And now it's, it's kind of clear that really the system had the potential energy. They shared the potential energy. And so we go back here now, and we recognize that there's a, a mutual potential energy between this pair of masses that looks like this. 
I'll say the potential energy of mass is, you know what? Like, yeah, this is confusing now because uh, of my numbering scheme. I'm, I'm thinking here. How about I just call this um, M1 and M2? And I'll say that M1 is equal to M2, and that's just what I'll call little m. They both have the same mass, which I'll call little m. M2 is the big one, which I'll call big M. So that's a little risky to, to call them both M. You have to make sure that the typesetting is noticeably different. So the, the mutual potential energy of masses one and two would be negative G, M1, M2. What am I doing here? I used tw uh, two twice. That's why it's, it's better if these videos are rehearsed. Mass one, mass two, mass three. Mass three is the big one, which I will call big M. Okay, so this should really be negative. I'm making mistakes all over the place here. The, the mutual potential energy of masses one and three, one and three would be negative G, M1, M3 over the distance between these to the first power. Now, in this case, I've set all the distances equal to one another, but this would be the expression for the mutual energy of these two. But the idea is that every pair of masses in this configuration has its own mutual energy. So I've got these two, these two, and these two. I can count three pairs. If I had more masses than just those three, it would be a little more complicated. What if I had them at the vertices of a square? I'd have this pair, this pair, this pair, this pair, this pair, and this pair. Six altogether, it would be easy to overlook one or two of those. So for a, a greater number of masses, it gets very difficult to count. Fortunately, there's a formula for counting them. Like in this case, I had four. I want to know how many uh, combinations of two I can choose from four. Four choose two, it turns out to be six. Is that true? Yes. You know what though? Because we're so short on time, I'm not going to emphasize that. I'll have to stick with configurations for which it's easy to count the number of pairs. Okay, so how much work does it take to separate all of these? Well, you're going to have to separate these two against their mutual attraction, these two, and these two. So where do we start? Our trusty old equation that says the work done by so-called external forces is the change in thermal energy plus the change in mechanical energy. And we say, well, in this prop, there is no thermal energy dissipated because we're not worried about air drag or friction. So that's gone. And since we're imagining that we're separating the masses, then yes, there is external work. We're the force doing the external work. So we can't cross this out. And there are two types of mechanical energy, change in kinetic and change in potential. Now for this problem, uh, the way I worded it, I said, how much energy would you have to expand to separate these or how much work you have to do to separate them out to infinity. So the, it's implicit that they start at rest and you just wanna pull them hard enough so that when you get them to infinity, they're also at rest. You don't wanna like separate them and fling them hard enough so that once they separate to infinity, they're still flying really fast. That's unnecessary. We just wanna have them start at rest and end at rest, but when they end at rest, they're infinitely far from one another, which means the gravity force between them has gone to zero and they will not fall back together. So beginning and ending kinetic energy is zero. We don't have to worry about the change in that. So we just, we're left with this very simple statement that the work you have to do is shows up as an increase in the potential energy of the system. Well, that's gonna be U final minus U initial. But the nice thing about our choice of potential energy is that for any given pair, what's the potential energy of this pair once they're separated infinitely far from one another? It's zero. The formula that we've been using GMM over R, when you plug in infinity, you get zero. Okay, so the final energy for all the pairs, also zero. And look how easy that is. The total work you have to do is just the negative of whatever joules you start out with to begin with. So think about this expression. See how it's negative? What if the potential energy of this pair was negative two joules? Negative two joules. This simple uh, interpretation says the work you'd have to do to separate them to infinity is the negative of that. In other words, two joules. So whatever the potential energy is, if it's negative two joules, you have to do positive two joules of work to separate them. It's a nice intuitive explanation there. So let's figure out what the total energy is in terms of symbols, and then it'll be fun to pick some actual numbers and see what we're talking about here. Okay, so U initial is, well, we've got for this pair, 
negative g. And remember, I called these two both little m and this is big M. So I've got a big M, little m over d. And do you see how this pair and this pair are equivalent? Because in each case, we have a little m and a big M separated by d. So I actually have two of those. I'll put a factor of two there. And then the last pair, negative g m m over r, my masses are little m and little m, so little m squared, little m squared over d. So for this particular problem, I could factor out g and d and negative one. I think I'll do that. So that's negative g little m over d. And then the first term I've got a two big M. And the next term I've got a, a plus little m. I'm just factoring things out to make this a little simpler. That's a little m, that's a big M. Okay, let's let's pick some everyday numbers. What if they were all one meter apart? Okay. And what if one is a baseball and one of them is like a bowling ball? Well, a 10 pound bowling ball would have a mass of something like four kilograms. So let's let four, or let's let big M equal four kilograms. And we'll let little m equal baseball's mass, I think was 100 and something grams. I'll just go with 150 grams. And let's say Every pair is separated by one meter. So in order to pull these apart, it's weird to think about because you've never done this in real life, but you've got two baseballs and a bowling ball out in space. And they're, they're pulling towards each other. There's a mutual attraction amongst them and you want to grab them, separate them all so that they're infinitely far from each other. How many calories are you going to burn by doing that? Can you burn even one calorie? I mean, they're not going to pull very hard on each other, so you don't have to pull very hard back, but you are pulling them through a, quite a large distance. I mean, infinitely far away. So let's see how much work is required. The work required we found was the negative of the initial potential energy. So I can just change that minus sign to a plus sign. And I've got 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th times the uh, little mass of 0.15 kilograms over the distance of one meter. And then I've got two times four kilograms plus one point, excuse me, point one five zero. I've used SI units for everything, so I know that SI units will come out. And we can already see the result. These are basically numbers like one, and this is a really, really small number. So eight plus eight plus point one five times point one five times six point six seven times ten to the negative eleventh. And I get eight times ten to the negative eleventh. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna write this as um, basically 80 instead of eight, I'll write this as 80, and I have to pay for that extra zero with another negative power of 10, times 10 to the negative 12 joules. And I chose to use the exponent 12 because we like these multiples of three, three, six, nine, 12, a trillionth of a joule, uh, what would that be called? Um, well, a billionth would be a nano joule, so a trillionth would be a pico joules. Okay, 80 pico joules of work. Hmm, okay. Well, what if you wanted to actually work out by doing this? It's a silly, uh, you know, imagine it's far in the future, people are living out in space and they wanna work out just like you would on Earth. And maybe you do so by just pulling masses apart against their mutual attractions. They float in the weightlessness of space. How many reps would you have to do to burn, let's say 100 calories? Let's figure that out right now, because so I have to know at <clears throat> one nutritional calorie, but the one you read about on the back of your Cheerios box is 4,190 basically joules. There's quite a number of joules in one calorie. So we'd like to figure out how many reps. And let's not worry about the fact that when you let the masses fall back together, there's also work being done. Let's just imagine that we pull them apart, let them go, let them fall back together, now, obviously, if you've really separated them to infinity, they would not fall back together. So suppose you, did, you just mostly separated them, and then maybe you gave them a little push to put them back together, and then you pull them apart again. So let's only worry about the work done and separated them, separating them. Okay, so let's see here. 80, mm, let's see here. One rep, I'm gonna do it that way, for every, 80 picojoules, that's 80 times 10 to the negative 12 joules. 
times, well, we've got 4,190 joules for every one calorie times uh, the unknown number N reps needs to equal, let's say you want to burn, oh, what, I knew I did this wrong. Should have thought that through first. Right, 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 okay, I'll get it right this time. I could edit this out where you see me uh, making mistakes here, but that wouldn't be honest, so I'll just leave it in. There are 80 times 10 to the negative 12th joules for every rep. Aha, uh -huh. and there's one calorie for every 4,190 joules times the number of reps, and that needs to equal 100 calories. Okay, now the, the units work out, see that? Because Reps cancel and joules will cancel and what we come out with is calories. So I'm saying this is how many joules you burn or how much external work you do with every rep where you separate these masses and we'd like to convert that into calories and then figure out how many reps are required to, to burn 100 calories in this set. Okay, so 80 peak joules. I'm solving for n, right? So I think I should take 100 and divide by all this stuff. I'll take 100, I'll multiply by 4190, divide by 80 trillion. So 100 times 4190 divided by 80 picajoules. It's fun to say picajoules. Sounds like picaboo. Or uh, Pikachu. 5 times 10 to the 15th reps. Hey, no sweat. Yeah, sure. What is that, uh, 5,000 trillion? All you have to do is pull the baseballs and the bowling ball apart 5,000 trillion times and you'll burn 100 calories. That's totally practical. Okay, so what have we concluded? Separating masses against their mutual gravitational attraction, not a feasible way to burn calories. You can't get in shape, lose any significant amount of weight by separating masses against their mutual gravitational attraction. Is that true? Are we sure about that? Why did this number come out so small? Every term in the, the uh, formula looks something like this. And G is a really small number, and we used regular old numbers for this. Well, how would you offset a really small number like 10 to the negative 11th? What if one of these numbers was really, really big? In fact, what if the two masses you were separating Instead of a, you know, a baseball and a baseball or a bowling ball and a baseball, what if one of your masses was, I don't know, like the size of the earth with a mass of six times 10 to the 24th kilograms? And then um, what if the other mass was, yeah, like a 10 pound dumbbell, 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 and you were just lifting it a foot off the ground or a couple feet and then put it back putting it back down, lifting it a foot, putting it back down. Should we do the calculation? Well, in this case, you're not actually separating to infinity. You're not taking this and moving it infinitely far away. But you could still, if you knew the initial separation, like maybe you start out where they're separated by the Earth's radius and then you, you lift it out to here. This is your R final. It's just a couple feet extra. Conceivably, you could look at the change in potential energy and use the same equation, right? External work is the change in potential energy. You could still calculate the external work, but in this case, one of your M's would be much larger. One of these M's is much larger, and the number that comes out in joules is not going to be 80 pico joules. It could be something significant. And I think you realize what I'm getting at. If you go to the gym and work out by lifting weights, this is exactly what you're doing, right? You're just, just pumping iron, you're lifting you're separating planet Earth and your dumbbell. You're just pulling them apart against their mutual attraction. This time the work required is much greater because one of the masses is so much larger, okay? And the last thing I'll point out here is, um, what did I wanna do? Matter of fact, I, I think I'll leave it at that. That would be a good problem to explore using realistic weights and distances, but 
you've got the concept. So we've talked about a uh, simple calculation of escape speed. We looked at the mutual energy of a collection of masses, in this case only three. Um, one thing that would be worth reviewing, uh, I've been imagining these escape speed problems. We imagine that we throw something just fast enough so that when it gets out to infinity, it comes to rest. But what if you wanted to throw it fast enough so that when it gets like 100 miles from the planet, it still has a specific speed. You could evaluate the kinetic energy at that point. So one of the terms in your initial equation would not necessarily be zero. This is our starting point for escape speed problems. Total energy at the start is total energy at the end. And I've been saying you know, zero potential energy at the end and zero kinetic energy because you just barely make it to infinity. Well, what if instead of launching so that it gets to infinity barely, you wanted to launch it out to a specific distance where it still has a certain amount of kinetic energy? Then these two terms would not be zero. You would evaluate this at the appropriate distance and you would evaluate this at the appropriate speed at that distance. It's still a conservation of energy problem, but the algebra is a little messier. So there are some problems in your homework like that, and we take a look at those. And that's pretty much it. Uh, like I said in the email, I will not be emphasizing the resolution of gravity forces into components. That's an important skill, but we're short on time. I would rather you be familiar with energy considerations and how to use this scalar potential negative g m1 m2 over r remember r is the distance between the centers of the two masses and it's understood that this is the potential energy compared to infinity this is the potential energy and let's just there's no clean paper anywhere here. once more here's the function it looks like this If you're a thousand miles above the Earth, Earth's surface, so or let's say uh, two thousand, no, that doesn't work. Twelve thousand kilometers from the center of the Earth, and then you move back towards the Earth. Remember, R is increasing in this direction, and then you're down at um, only eight thousand kilometers from the center of the Earth. If you think about things vertically, if you're falling back towards the Earth, your potential should be dropping, right? Well, now look at it this way. As, as R decreases from 12,000 to 8,000, what's important here is that the potential energy dropped. See that? If this is our initial and this is our final, this is delta U, and it's less than zero. The potential energy dropped. It went from here, this horizontal line, to this horizontal. So don't be confused by the fact that the potential energy is a curve on the negative side of the r-axis. That throws a lot of people off. All that matters is the way the potential energy changes as you move towards or away from the Earth. In this case, you see that when you move towards, the potential energy drops as it should.